Let us pray. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears, that we may hear your word in scripture and song and the warmth of members to our right and left in your holy presence in this lovely space. In Christ we pray. Amen. So raise your hand when you recognize the short, the source, or just shout out if you want. Where do all the blue skies go? Poison is the wind that blows from north and south and east. Oil wasted on the ocean and upon our seas. Fish full of mercury. Am I going to have to start singing this? I don't see any hands here. I see one hand. All right. <laughs> Radiation underground and in the sky. Animals and birds who live nearby die. Who really cares to save a world in despair? Who really cares? Who's willing to try to save the world destined to die? It fills me with sorrow, little children today going to suffer tomorrow. Marvin Gaye, 1971. What's going on? I promised Nancy I wouldn't sing it. You'd all be jumping up shouting if I'd done that. <laughs> Uh, escort that person out. <laughs> well, we're smiling now, but here's the truth. We are destroying the earth. That's a fact we all have to deal with. And some of us have been slow to get on board Yes, there's poverty and hunger, racism and white supremacy, homophobia and gender bias, violence and war, and we are destroying the only earth we will ever have. What is it this week? Fires in California, rising sea levels, unusually hot or cold temperatures, and exactly the opposite of the places we normally expect one or the other. Nature was always regularly harsh, fierce, normal conditions can be deadly. It has always been so, but now it is horrific. Deadly beyond anything we have experienced multiple times in every season of every year. And we are accelerating the process. Our actions, our agency, human agency, is aiding the destruction, increasing the intensity, unleashing forces that will, we are told with certainty, that will bring about catastrophic, irreversible damage to the earth and to every living thing. Bill Coffin preached here in a time when the imminent terror was nuclear war. And the common fiction was that only roaches would survive. Well, we have not escaped that dilemma. But what we've done is multiply the methods by which we do great harm to ourselves and the earth. We won't stop burning fossil fuels as we drive and fly all over the planet. We won't stop mining and burning coal. We won't stop littering the earth with plastic bottles and plates, cups and straws, shopping bags and packaging of all kinds. Do you know that Norway will ban the sale of electric cars and get all fossil fuel driven cars off the road in 2025? That's five years from now. France and Germany in 2030. We have no such plans here in the United States. In fact, 
safeguards are being reversed now. We are destroying the earth. We are destroying ourselves. The crisis in the Middle East has been raging since 1948, and there are no signs that it is abating, that it will be resolved soon or ever. Israel has taken more land, built more settlements, established more checkpoints, assuring it seems clear that no two-state solution is possible. Palestinians have remained unshakable in their determination to resist with violence in response to what they perceive as their mass incarceration on shrinking land that once belonged to them. Anti-Semitism exploded this week in a deadly shooting at the J.C. Kosher supermarket in Jersey City. We are destroying ourselves. Hate in our own nation and its stepchild violence are on the rise. I was riding home from an errand a few days ago and I heard on the radio, it was Philadelphia, a Philadelphia station, that the 105th, the 105th child that day, a young girl, had been shot early December in that city. 105 young people shot in just Philadelphia this year. That would be one kid almost every other day for the entire year. Don't let that sink in. And we grieve, as you heard Bruce for our neighbors at Barnard over the killing of Tessa Majors, a student in her first year of college, about four blocks from here, and apparently by a 14-year-old boy. Our president, who it appears is running the government all by himself, feeds this is a symbol of hatred and exclusion. His re-election, and doesn't Boris's victory in Great Britain send chills through your body? His re-election will be a blow to our nation. It's meaning chilling to comprehend. I had coffee with a wise friend a few weeks ago who suggested that a decision to move to Canada if Trump is re-elected is a valid consideration of what it means to have a home, to live in a country that values its people, all of them. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, our government, is preparing three rules. One has already been finalized that will make more than three million people ineligible for critical nutrition assistance. Let me say it plainly. Take away their food stamps. A school district in Pennsylvania, I'm not picking on Pennsylvania, I guess uh, NPR, Philadelphia is what you get when you live in New Jersey. A school district in Pennsylvania threatened to put children who owed as little as $10 for school lunches at the end of the year in foster care. I am not making this up. There are so many reasons to be pessimistic about where we are as a country, about the state of the small C church, about our own particular set of circumstances here at Riverside. There are plenty of reasons for us to be sad and depressed about the conditions in our own lives. My 95-year-old dad fell last week, making his way, feeling the wall and early in the morning. He didn't break anything 
but my mom and sisters say he's beginning to show signs of dementia. Do you recognize these names? Margaret Madden, Percy King, Gary Cummings, Carolyn Witherspoons. These are members of Riverside whose names have been on our prayer list for months, some of them. So many needs, so much pain and suffering, so much for which to be concerned. Last Sunday, Reverend Northern and Minister Jordan led a very well-attended service of hope and consolation. And even this filled with joy season of the year, there are many among us who know deep sorrow. I haven't forgotten, this is Advent. The season of quiet expectation, of hope and anticipation for something better, something purer, something nobler, something to restore us to wholeness, to save us, we dare hope. The Czech, uh, Czech dissident and first post-communist president of Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, said about hope, Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it will turn out. We do want our current, dismal, ready-to-move-to-Canada something to turn out well, but we'll settle for it making sense, won't we? I would if it could just make sense. Making room for joy. How in this world can we do that? As ever, our scripture offers guidance. This text for I, from Isaiah is for us as much as it was for 8th century Hebrews. The prophet speaks in the fourth verse to those who are of a fearful heart. That's the NRSV translation, and it's a good one. And later in that same verse, we're told, do not fear. But a more literal translation of the Hebrew phrase, nimhare leb, would be, and I'm quoting here, ones whose hearts are racing. That's me. That's us, maybe. I've awakened more than a few times in the dark hours of the morning lately with my heart racing about this or that, some new revelation, some new thing that has happened in our world, in our church, in my life or the life of my family. My heart racing. Maybe it's just a thought about a sermon on the horizon, sometimes about an unresolved issue, nagging, festering, heart racing, waiting for a shaft of Advent light. In the oracle in the 34th chapter, God is enraged against all the nations. One chapter later, our chapter, God is making the desert bloom. And that's our God. That's the God of Advent. The God bringing joy to the world as Advent turns to Christmas and our humanity gets a lift from the gift of a child. Did you hear Handel's Messiah in the reading of this text from Isaiah? The alto recitative. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man live as an heart. 
And did your heart start to sing the words we hear every time this great music is sung? Our hearts may be fearful, racing, depressed that our society cannot seem to let go but would rather repeat the worst of its history more blatantly these days than at any time in recent memory. But there is yet more for us in this fourth verse. God will come with vengeance, the prophet says. God will come and rescue us. Well, that word translated vengeance, biblical scholar Henrik Peels tells us, has more to do with retribution that brings liberation to the oppressed, freedom from a situation of need, and the restoration of justice. So you see, not vengeance, but restorative justice. That's our God. That's the God of Advent. Is there wilderness? Is the earth in trouble? God is here to help us find a way to heal the earth. Joy! Is the desert dry and parched? God can lead to springs of fresh water to quench even the thirst of the earth. Joy! Are we unreconciled in this color-crazed nation, still suffering from centuries of bowing to gold and silver at the expense of flesh and blood? We may yet do the hard work by God's grace to redeem even this travesty. Joy! God is infinite and almighty, full of grace and truth, joy. God will find a way with us, through us, by our hands and voices, our strength, our humanity, joined together, helping one another move us from where we are to where in the providence of God we can get. This is Advent, and God speaks when we make room for joy in our very humanity, because that is where our anticipation leads, to one who was just like us, beginning anew at the end of every Advent as we do at the start of every day. There is joy to come in the birth of Jesus, in our human flesh. Joy! This vision of a God of infinite and unstoppable hope is the one we need this and every Advent. For the one we celebrated Christmas knew no person or situation so dead that he could not find life in it. In that way, among so many others, the God of Isaiah is so like the Christ to come. The hope we have in Jesus is not just about personal deliverance, 
the joyous hope of Advent is not simply about easing our individual troubles. It is nothing less than the transformation of society and nature itself. This and every Advent, making room for joy means God in Christ, the child of Advent, makes all nature sing. There's joy in that, my friends. Joy. Joy. Amen.